Welcome, everyone. Pleased to have you here with us today for our 77th, I believe, episode of This is CDR. This is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air to explore the range of carbon removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals Open Air seeks to advance at every level of government here in the U.S., as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions globally. My name is Toby Bryce. I work on policy and market development with Open Air based in Brooklyn, New York. If you haven't done so already, please uh, introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from. And when you do that, make sure you're directing your message to everyone and not just hosts and panelists so everyone can see. Uh, hear from you. Quick background on open air. If you're not familiar with us, we're a distributed all volunteer network dedicated to advancing carbon removal. Uh, we are a global community working together on shared open source projects that we call missions in the areas of policy, innovation, communications, and activist market development. Open Air co-founder Chris Neidl is uh, running the chat, and there will be a bunch of links in there uh, with some background information on Open Air and the work we do. And there's a link that um, you can follow to fill out a form and join our group. And we'd love to have you be a part of what we're doing. Here's a, <clears throat> this is from our website. I think there's a link to this in the chat too that Chris just put in there. But we we have several dozen, a few dozen live missions and projects that we're working on. Um, kind of you know something for everyone really, and we'd love to have you check it out and um, get and join join our join our group. Before we get started, as always, just some quick background on defining our terms. This is a definition of carbon removal from a great resource called the CDR Primer. It's essentially the same definition that is used by the IPCC, um, which just published their final version of their AR6 uh, synthesis report, um, and it's right in there. You can find it. And um, purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. Um, <clears throat> two really important things to call out when we talk about carbon removal. Number one, to disambiguate it from quote unquote carbon capture or CCS, um, point source carbon capture, which is capturing CO2 from an emission stream, um, for example, from a cement plant or a natural gas power plant, the fossil carbon emission stream. This may or may not be a good techno-economic techno solution for uh, you know, climate impact, depending on its specific context, but one thing it's not is carbon removal. It's a form of emissions reduction, reducing emissions, and uh, it's not taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is what carbon removal is. Number two, um, when we talk about carbon removal, it's important to call out from the rooftops always repeatedly that carbon removal is in no way, shape, or form any sort of substitute for reducing emissions. We need to reduce uh, fossil greenhouse gas emissions and and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible. It's 90 plus percent of our climate work. And without that work, carbon removal will have no purpose because we'll, the climate will be heading in the wrong direction too quickly. Carbon removal, the purpose of carbon removal is to, um, to remove the, uh, neutralize the emissions we can't eliminate and um, produce in a climate relevant time frame. Uh, that's order of 10% of emissions. They're from some industrial sources like cement and steel potentially, and definitely from agriculture. Um, there's clear scientific consensus that, that that volume is gonna be gigaton scale by mid-century. That's billions of tons per year. Um, after mid-century, we're gonna have approximately 2 trillion tons or more of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere that we're gonna need to remove to restore our climate um, to a safer state. And so it's a tremendous uh, job ahead of us. Um, we're currently at tens of kilotons in terms of scale, and we need to like ramp that up dramatically. And that's why we're here today, and that's what we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna hand it over to a special guest co-host, Tank Chen, um, who we're very excited to have with us, a great open air advocate based in Taiwan. And he's going to talk a little bit about run of show and introduce today's presenters. Tang? Thank you, Toby. Hello, everyone. I'm Tang. I'm a member of Open Air's communications team. Um, some housekeeping notes before we start. Our format today will be a short presentation followed by a few prepared questions, then a moderated audience Q&A. So please type your, ends, uh, type your questions. Um, into the Zoom Q&A box, okay? That is different from the chat box. Um, also, this event is being recorded. We will send the video link to everyone who registered and also post the video to Open Air's website and YouTube channel. This week, we're pleased to welcome Carba founder, CEO, Dr. Andrew Jones, and senior advisor, uh, Professor Paul Donhauer, to this is CDR to discuss the company's method of long duration CDR via biomass torrefaction and burial. Dr. Andrew Jones is an entrepreneur, chemical engineer, inventor, and an energy enthusiast. Before founding Carva, Andrew started and built activated research company, ARC, an innovation firm that develops analytical technology for scientists. ARC's portfolio of products include a novel NSF-funded detector for pharmaceutical drug development, 
world leading technology for CO2 measurement and tools for analyzing pyrolysis products and biofuels. He and his work has been the recipient for several awards, including the 2023 Neil Armstrong Award of Excellence, Astronaut Scholar, R&D 100, NSF Graduate Fellow, 35 and Under Young Entrepreneur Award, and Minnesota Cup Energy Clean Tech winner. He also holds four patents. Professor Paul Denhauer is the Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Minnesota Twin City and the MacArthur Fellow. His research focuses on developing new technology new technologies for converting biomass material derived from organic renewable sources into chemical building blocks of products that are currently sourced from fossil fuels. With expertise spent reaction chemistry, specific chemical uh, transformation, and catalysis and, and uh, engineering accelerating reactions, Dan Howard is opening new pathways for mitigating the environmental impacts of commodity chemicals. Um, now for the main event uh, presenters, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Tank. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having us. Let me share my slides here. All right, uh, so the story of CARBA actually begins back in 2005 uh, when Paul and I met in the undergraduate or graduate lab of Professor Lanny Schmidt at the University of Minnesota. We were both doing catalytic fast pyrolysis of biomass, trying to make things like hydrogen, jet fuel, uh, and uh, other renewable fuels. And fast forward about 20 years later, now we're finally putting some of that into practice with CARBA. So at CARBA, I'm the CEO and co-founder, and we're putting solid carbon back underground. Paul has done an enormous number of things at his uh, laboratory since then. He's actually spun off five different companies focused on using biomass to make things like soaps and plastics, and now CARBA to store that carbon underground. Uh, myself, uh, you guys heard a little bit of an intro, uh, worked in the analytical industry where we helped make tools for scientists to develop the next great fuels and look at pyrolysis gases. Now the problem, I think you're all familiar in this program with the problem of climate change, but the, I think the good news, and it's good to reiterate all this, is that the science is very clear. There's too much CO2 in the atmosphere, that's anthropogenic, and that's causing the global temperatures to rise. And what's very scary is that we can reach this so-called tipping point uh, where it becomes autocatalytic and we can't really get back to where uh, we're at safe temperatures. So we need to act now. Um, the other important thing is that the, the science is also very clear about how we can fix that. Uh, so that's great news. Uh, the bad news is it's gonna be uh, very difficult. So there's really a two-pronged strategy to fix climate change or prevent the worst effects of climate change. And that is transitioning away from fossil fuel usage. And the second piece is removing the existing carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, so-called CDR. To get an understanding of the scale of what's needed to be done, we need to remove about a trillion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the next 70 or so years. That scale, if you were to liquefy CO2, a trillion tons, is about the size of Lake Erie in volume. That's an enormous problem, not only uh, to just capture that from the air, but also to store it somewhere um, in that sort of volume. It's a little bit less in the density of graphite uh, and a little bit low, uh, more in the density of, of charcoal. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about some strategies to do that, but I think the good news is we know how to do this. Now we just need to put, uh, put our action in. So let's go, let's do this. Uh, so about 150 years plus of fossil fuel industrialization has put hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that was because we were burning these fuels, of course, coal and oil for energy, and we have left our climate in crisis. Uh, so to repair the damage, it's actually quite simple. We need to take that CO2 back and we need to put it underground. And so CARBA exists to serve that purpose. There's a number of different ways that have been proposed to do this, and I'm not gonna go into all of these ways. There's a number of great talks on uh, all these approaches, and we need multiple approaches to get to this billion ton level. Uh, what we're gonna focus on today is a relatively novel method of taking plant and tree waste and torrifying it or converting it and removing the food value of those carbohydrates and then burying it underground in an anoxic regions. And that really replicates the formation of coal that happened 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous period. 
Now, the problem today is that the current costs of CDR are incredibly high. And so to gain mass adoption of these technologies, we really need to come down on the price curve for all of these technologies. And so what CARBA looked at when we first started this is what are the technologies that are really going to scale rapidly? How can we get down the cost curve very rapidly? Uh, and specifically, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, there's an entropic penalty just embedded in the fact that we're going from 400 ppm and we need to concentrate it. And so there's going to need to be a lot of energy that goes into that, uh, about 20 kilojoules per mole uh, at a minimum, just to separate the CO2 from the atmosphere. And then you need additional energy to put it on the ground. That energy needs to come from somewhere. And ideally, it's from you know, solar or renewable resources. So what Paul and I did when we were looking at starting Carbo was what are the best ways um, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere? And luckily, nature has already given us the best direct air capture machine, machine. So plants and trees, they breathe in carbon dioxide and they use solar energy, sunlight, to upgrade the carbon dioxide into carbohydrates that form the structure of the plant. So those are things like cellulose, hemicellulose, and also lignin. And these polymeric structures are great at storing that carbon dioxide. Now, the only problem is when those trees die or those plants die, they re-release all that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But plants and trees are these great direct air capture machines because they self-replicate, they grow without human intervention for the most part, and they run on solar power. So how do we utilize these great aspects and do it at a scale that's meaningful for the climate? So CARBA intervenes at that critical point where plants and trees die or are harvested and begin to decay. So a plant or tree may grow for a couple of years or, or many decades, but at some point it dies or is burned down um, or is harvested. And at that point, it starts to decay. And so without CARBA's technology, those plants and trees will decay and re-release 100% of that carbon dioxide that's stored in that plant back into the atmosphere and worse yet, it'll release some methane along the process as well, depending on how that decay happens. With Carbos technology, we're able to torrify or pyrolyze some of that material and gain about 80% of that carbon, uh, up to 80% um, stored in, the, in a torrified charcoal. Uh, and that prevents the decay when we bury it deep in anoxic regions. So the process looks something like this. We take plant and tree waste, which have already breathed in the CO2 and created those carbohydrates and, and complex polymers. We take that waste material, this is a classic biker's approach for, for all those familiar, um, with a bit of a twist on burial. We take those uh, materials, we put them through a reactor that gives us incredibly high yield. And Paul will talk about the science uh, on this later. Incredibly high yield of carbon. So we're getting 60 to 80% carbon yield uh, in that final material. And it creates a charcoal-like substance that has limited to no food value. So we've removed the, the water from those carbohydrates. And now these structures are much more resistant to microbial and fungal attack. And then we can bury it underground in these anoxic regions, which really mimics the burial of, of coal that happened 300 million years ago. So one thing that people a lot of people don't understand is that 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous period, trees and plants were growing, but microbes had not evolved yet to break down lignin. And so these trees would fall and they would just get piled and piled and piled and piled. And that, and eventually they would get buried and that created all the coal seams that we've dug up and burned today. So to reverse that process, we need to essentially put that carbon back underground uh, where we dug it up. I wanted to show you as well, here is a sample of, oh, it's gonna be hard with the blur. Um, there we go. Uh, here's a sample of, of some of the material. So it's, it's a, one of the benefits is that it's incredibly inert. You know, you can touch it, you can hold it, you can weigh it um, and do a chemical analysis to figure out how much carbon is in it. So it makes the MRV portion of all of this very easy. It's very visual. We can bury it, we can take core samples or dig it up to ensure that it's still there. Um, and it's incredibly inert. This stuff is already being spread on uh, agricultural soils. One of, uh, one of the things that's happening in the market today is this sort of push or, or move towards quality. Um, and when we talk about CDR quality, it's typically talked about low, 
medium and high permanence. And so I've created this chart, which has been really adapted from Robert Hoagland, uh, which I think is a fantastic chart that shows sort of the expected storage lifetime of the carbon and the reversal risk. And what we're seeing is that companies who are purchasing CDR credits, they really want a blended portfolio where they have some of these sort of high risk afforestation, reforestation uh, credits where there's a risk that those trees may fall down and die or, or be burned down, but then they have uh, more and more a larger portfolio size of their portfolio focused on these low risk uh, reversal strategies, things like direct air capture where we're putting CO2 underground, we know it's stable, mineralization of CO2, we know that calcium carbonate or limestone is stable over um, many, many years, and burying solid carbon or a liquid carbon um, deep underground. Um, so that's really where CARBA has focused, is we need something that is permanent with an incredibly low risk of reversal. And to we can't do studies that are a year or too long and extrapolate to 100,000 years. That just doesn't statistically work. So in order to derive the conclusion that we're going to have hundreds of thousands of years of permanence, we really need to look at the history and what has been stable for those millions of years. And that, that's pretty simply, you know, coal, oil underground, um, gases like CO2 and methane, and uh, mineralization or rocks. Uh, so that's really where we're focused at CARBA. And with that, I want to hand it off to Paul, who's going to talk a little bit more about the science of why this works and how we're able to increase our yield. Yes, thank you, Andrew. So if we want to take carbohydrates, which is the dominant portion of lignocellulosic biomass and turn it into a char, we really need to understand the chemistry of what's happening. And this is an area we've been working in my laboratory at the University of Minnesota for the past 15 years. And one of the key uh, discoveries we made was in 2016 was to understand how carbohydrates decompose at high temperature. And what you can see here, this is a paper we wrote in Chemistry of Materials. If, you, if you're familiar with looking at charts like this, this might be very intuitive. If not, uh, it, you, you're just looking for that vertical green line where there's a, there's a transition in the way the chemistry proceeds. Um, at about 467 degrees C, uh, uh, the rate at which these long polymer chains of cellulose decompose uh, accelerates dramatically. And so one thing we know for sure is when we operate a reactor, we want to be able to convert lignocellulosic material below that transition temperature. But of course, we'd like to be relatively close to it if we can to get the benefit of productivity of the reactor. So there's a lot of fundamental science that goes into thinking about what we want a torrefaction reactor to achieve. So if you go to the next slide, one of the things we think about is, of course, how we can design a reactor that uh, is portable so we can move it around, but also incredibly low cost. And one of the ways to get low cost is to think of it on a per ton basis, which means we want a lot of productivity. So how can we get a high yield biochar of quality carbon uh, through a reactor as fast as possible? Now, there's if you're an engineer, there's all you're used to thinking of all of these different time scales of the process. And one of these, of course, is the reaction time scale. How fast does the biomass convert to a solid carbon? But in any high temperature process, particularly with solids, uh, you're worried about uh, heat transfer as well. And so if you look at if you look at a lot of torrefaction or biochar reactors that are on the market, there's hundreds of different types. So let me first say that, you know, there if people refer to biochar, a lot of people think of these as kind of this monolithic uniform process, and that's not the case at all. There's hundreds of different reactors with very different performance in yield, cost, composition, uh, time scale. Uh, so most of them exist, you can see up there with a reaction time up around the hour period. So if you take that that yellow region in the middle there, you usually let uh, woody materials react for tens of minutes to an hour or plus. Um, and so what we know is based on the kinetics of heat transfer and reaction, it's possible to get this down to much lower time scales, an order of magnitude faster. Now, uh, if you can go 10 times faster, that means you can process 10 times the amount of material through the same reactor. And that drives down the capital cost and the operating cost dramatically. And uh, you know this all connects back to the things Andrew was talking about, permanence being very important, but of course also the cost. And a lot of times in biomass processing technology, capital cost can be a big problem. We overcome that by incredibly high throughput reactor technology. And this is where I'm not showing you the reactor here uh, until this picture, but these ideas in the previous slide 
now are incorporated into a lot of intellectual property associated with the reactor you see there uh, and how we actually make that happen. So you can see this is uh, Andrew standing in front of the reactor. You can see what goes in. You can see what comes out. Uh, these reactors have the ability for high throughput and a very small footprint. You can see it's relatively small, something that can go on the back of a truck. And uh, this also connects back to the economics. We think about biomass supply. There's a lot of it, but it's distributed. And so we want to be able to put reactors in places where we can acquire biomass, but also where we can bury the resulting torrified material. This gives us a, a distinct advantage. These are low cost uh, capital pieces of equipment compared to conventional biomass processes where the investment might be half a billion dollars. These are low cost and they have very fast payback. On top of that, they have autothermal design. So we're not adding heat to the process continuously while it's running. We have had a pilot facility operating for, it's closing in on a year and we're building additional reactors uh, as we speak. So if we go to the next slide, uh, how do we evaluate this now? You think of all of the possibilities for how we can take this, this advanced reactor technology and implement it. And you know, there's many types of biomass. There's many ways to bury biomass. There's also many different locations which have different uh, characteristics. So to account for all of this, we think about all the possible applications around the world. We can look at uh, models where we take into account all of the different inputs. And there's two models that are in our paper. If you're interested in this paper, uh, it was placed, post the link to it was posted in the chat, or you can just take your phone and look at the QR code that'll take you right to it. It's an open access paper with ACS Engineering Gold. But you can see one of the two models is a mass energy model. The other one is an economic model, but there's kind of this nice cartoon diagram on the bottom there of what goes in and what comes out. We take all of those parameters and we develop a, a distribution of what are the possible values of that. Uh, a Gaussian distribution for many of these. And we say, what is the average and what are, how many standard deviations is this gonna vary? And when we do a Monte Carlo analysis where you, you simulate 10,000 possible outcomes to evaluate how these combine together with different uh, scenarios. So if we go to the next slide though, the output of that, oh, next slide. The output of this of course tells us what kind of scenarios can lead to good performance. Now, one of the things we care a lot about because this is an extreme commodity, we're interested in high yield of carbon coming out of the reactor. So we look at some of the inputs, such as uh, how much carbon uh, we're emitting uh, by any processing, such as trucking that we have to do, but also what is the yield of the reactor? So the net CO2 storage per ton of biomass, we would like that to be as high as possible. And you can see here the frequency, the vertical axis, is how many scenarios we're getting that give you that particular net storage of CO2. And you can see the average here is about 0.81 tons of CO2 per ton of biomass. But some of the scenarios give you really nice uh, uh, carbon yield, for example, over uh, unity, for example. And this accounts for even things like biomass moisture content of 10 to 48 percent. We obviously, like most biomass processors, prefer biomass that's low moisture content, not freshly cut. But this allows us to look at the landscape of all possible opportunities and say, if we have portable reactors and we have 10,000 of them, where do we want to place all of those? We can now take all of those uh, locations and characteristics and start to match up the best opportunities that allow us to continue and expand the operation to get the most CO2 out of the atmosphere. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, this then allows us to connect this up to a comparable Monte Carlo can, uh, economic model. And in this manuscript, you can look at this, we can say, what are the costs associated with all of these different uh, aspects of the operation? And again, we assign a distribution of probability of what those costs will be. For example, how much biomass costs? What are the fuel costs? What are the capital cost variations? And you can see here, and when this comes out, about a quarter of the scenarios lead to costs to manufacture and produce a ton of CO2 uh, under $100. And the average is somewhere around $100. The majority of these uh, costs are in the low hundreds of low hundred dollar range, and the majority of them, less than 95 percent, are under $200 per ton. You can see the benefit of this approach is incredibly low cost processing and production of uh, solid carbon. So when we put this all together. Uh, we can start to look at individual scenarios. So here's an average scenario we look at to achieve $100 cost uh, of carbon sequestration. So if we assume, for example, that uh, biomass costs $34 per ton, some places it costs more, some places zero, some places will pay you to take the, 
the biomass such that it's negative. Uh, we can account for diesel and trucking, but you can see here that the capital cost, the reactor is not the biggest component of all of the costs that's going on. And that has to do with the design and the implementation of that particular cost. But you can imagine scenarios, the ones that come in under $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent. Some of these costs are, are that look large here, for example, like the biomass are actually quite small depending on the application. But this allows us to evaluate each individual scenario. If we then do a sensitivity analysis of all of the aspects of this particular approach, you can see that consistent with almost all commodity processing, uh, selectivity, or in this case, carbon yield is the way to define that selectivity, is number one, the most important thing. We want a reactor that's retaining the maximum amount of carbon in the biomass into the char, just because that affects our, our overall yield and that affects the, the amount that we can take out of the air and permanently store. After that, it's biomass carbon content and moisture content. And after that, all of the other contributions to the cost are quite small. So that's why reactor performance and the, the novelty and intellectual property that we have in our reactor is so important for the performance here of this particular system. Now, this is great because we can start to imagine a scenario where we take these reactors and manufacture them uh, in mass. And we can put these all over sorts of different lo locations all over the United States, all over North America, and eventually all over the world, such that we're applying them to all sorts of different biomass, but also other applications such as food waste or paper waste, where we again have carbohydrates that we can convert to, to permanent carbon and store underground. Now, if you, if you think about this, you can start to look at the plot that Andrew showed earlier, where we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions and this National Academy of Sciences projection of how, many, how much negative CO2 emissions we need per year. For example, by 2050, the goal is to get about 10 uh, gigatons of biomass uh, per year processed, um, which would give us the equivalent of 10, roughly the equivalent of 10 gigatons of CO2 equivalent processed. We can do that by looking at, a, a, in the range here, of several hundred thousand reactors operating around the world, which is very doable, especially when we talk about sites where we might have five or six reactors operating in parallel. And this is possible because we know that around the world, there's 40 plus billion tons of biomass waste in all sorts of different forms. And you can start to think about places where biomass right now is either uh, just decomposing, uh, such as forests, where thinning processes would be would be ideal, particularly in places like Canada, where forest fires are a problem. If we can provide economic value to those thinning processes, we could, of course, reduce forest fires, but also take economic advantage of the opportunity to put that carbon back underground. Agricultural waste is a big one. If you look at places where massive piles of decomposing and rotting biomass waste uh, exist, or they're put back in the soil where they decompose, and within a year or two, that's a problem. Or something like uh, fibers, waste fibers like uh, cardboard. There's lots of independent uh, sites where there's an immense amount of waste cardboard that's produced that has to be trucked and hauled around, potentially recycled or burned. Um, a big issue for municipalities, of course, is waste biomass, whether that be for uh, problems such as the emerald ash borer, where it's destroying ash trees, or even electrical uh, issues where you have to trim back trees continuously to keep them away from electrical wires. Municipalities produce a lot of biomass waste. And you can imagine each one having one to 10 of these reactors operating uh, around their cities or even more for larger applications. So if you go to the next slide, um, we can talk then about our, our permanent carbon storage. So the benefit here is that uh, this approach is incredibly low cost, but the torrefaction does something that Andrew was talking about earlier, which is we're converting the, the carbohydrates, which, which are very amenable to uh, microbial and fungal decomposition to something that's very difficult for them to process if it's stored in, in particular locations, in which case underground in this anoxic zone uh, allows the biochar to the, the torrefied carbon to be there for thousands of years. And that's a very important aspect here, as Andrew was talking about, we can verify that it's there for a long period of time just by digging it up and seeing and, and, and knowing its location. Uh, it keep, makes it very easy to track, but it also guarantees this long-term permanence that's of interest for high, higher value carbon credits. So let me, uh, let me, let me conclude here and then I'll, I'll let Andrew add anything else he wants to say about this. Um, the CDR technology is very significantly with cost. And I, if I give you kind of one way to think about this, every $100 per ton uh, that is added to a CDR technology, if you were to try to offset gasoline purchases, for example, adds a dollar per gallon of gasoline. 
So if you're paying $600 per ton of CO2, you just added $6 per gallon of gasoline that you would purchase. Now that's, that's of course, not viable. If we can get down to uh, the, the $100 to $200 range, now we're talking about increasing the cost of gasoline 25 to 50%. That's not desirable, but it's in the range of what's, what's possible for the average consumer for what they work with. Um, now, this can be done with these low, low cost, ca low capital cost modular systems. Um, they can be distributed to all sorts of locations to get the volume that we're interested in and then be scaled rapidly because we can mass produce reactors of this type using conventional manufacturing processes. And finally, the thousand year permanence is what gives you the highest value credit and enables this type of implementation. Let me turn it back over to Andrew here. He probably has other things he wants to add on top of what I've been saying. Yeah, Paul, that was great. I, I think we should probably move to Q&A. There's a lot of questions popping up uh, in the interest of time. So let's let's jump over to that. Great. Um, we do have a few prepared questions we'll start with. And then, um, yes, we have a lot of great questions coming in um, in the Q&A. And everyone, please put them in the Q&A channel because it's very difficult to manage them if they're also in the chat. Um, love the presentation. I love the techno-economic detail, Monte Carlo analyses. So thank you for sharing all that. Um, I think maybe let's skip straight to talk a little bit about the, the, the process. Um, maybe, you know, it's, you, you're, you can work with any kind of residual biomass. Um, yeah, if you guys want to unshare the screen, maybe we can, then, then we can have folks oh, see who's talking. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so is there pretreatment of the biomass? Does it vary? First question, is there pretreatment of the biomass needed before the thermal conversion? And does it vary by the type of feedstock, whether it's crop residues or wood or cardboard or what have you? Yeah, great question. We really wanted to build this to be biomass agnostic and be able to take in as much biomass as possible. So the only requirement we have today is we wanna be less than 40% moisture. And we have some strategies to get above that in the future as well. Uh, in terms of form factor, there's been a lot of, there's been a history of failures of biomass utilization projects from Kior to Range Fuels to Ineos. And a lot of those are around handling biomass. And so we've, uh, one of our co-founders is a bulk material handling expert and has helped us uh, kind of get around those problems and design it to take in wood chips as big as, you know, six inches by two inches, which drastically reduces the energy cost. You know, as you, as you try to cut biomass down into smaller and smaller pieces, the energy cost goes up exponentially. So we wanted to avoid any of that and be able to process relatively unprocessed biomass, not need to hammer mill it down to a powder, uh, which could be incredibly expensive and add a lot of uh, infrastructure as well. So. Uh, the, the summary is we can take in uh, pretty much any type of bio, uh, biomass waste with minimal to no pre-processing. Got it. And then on the thermal conversion, one ton gets you to 0.8 tons of net CO2 on average. And obviously that can vary a lot by a lot of different factors, whether it's the feedstock, moisture content, temperature of the thermal conversion, et cetera. I think Paul's research says that 467 degrees Celsius is kind of the optimal, maybe average temperature for the thermal conversion. Can you walk us through the specifics of what happens? So how much CO2E in average is in a ton of feedstock? And then when you convert it on average, what is happening with the CO2E that's being lost? And then are you creating syngas, any other uh, byproducts to get to that, you know, 0.8? tons of net CO2E. Maybe I can start and Andrew can can follow up. Let me let me just make one point clear that 467 transition is a really important number because it it dictates whether you're really breaking the polymer and cracking it to vapors or, or you're just dehydrating it. So a carbohydrate is carbon plus water and that's what we would if we could maximize that and just make water and carbon that would we would do. You can never completely make only carbon or only make vapors. There's always a distribution. And so I don't think Andrew has publicly stated what the operating temperature of a reactor is, but that transition is really important uh, to point out. Um, so uh, we, like I said, we never fully make only carbon. We do make some vapors. We do make some permanent gases and the reactor is autothermal because we take those off gases and use them to drive the rest of the chemistry. 
Um, so the ratio that's there depends on the performance of a particular biomass that we're working with, its moisture content, its composition, uh, and reaction conditions. And so that varies a little bit, but uh, it's actually a pretty straightforward calculation to say how much energy am I getting in those off gases. Now you need enough off gases to keep it autothermal, but you would also like to be as close to energy neutral as possible to maximize carbon, solid carbon that you make. That's a very simple answer. Andrew maybe wants to add anything to that. Yeah, so it, there's layers on this, but essentially if you take a ton of biomass um, and it's you know maybe 30% moisture on average, and then on average, it's about 50% carbon um, when you remove that mat moisture. And then, so the carbon that's left over from that, you multiply by 44 over 12 to get the CO2 equivalent. That's about 1.3 tons of CO2 equivalents. So one ton of biomass, after you remove the water and get to the carbon, you get to 1.3 tons of CO2e. And you know, with our model, we're able to get somewhere between 0.8 to, to 1, 1 1.2, depending on the, the scenario that we're looking at. Um, and that really depends on all those variables and, and some of the reactor yields that we're getting. And, and if, if I just add a little bit to that, I, you know, we have in the scenarios, we look at everything, even in that scenario accounts for the bad scenario. So when we say average, that doesn't mean that's what we'll perform. That means if we look at all scenarios, point A is the average. We're obviously going to start with the higher value uh, applications. And so don't take point eight as the number that you would get. We're, we're going to go after the, the, the most valuable opportunities first. And so like sort of the, maybe the target carbon efficiency, uh, if I can do this math in my head is, on the order of 10 13th. So like, is it in the 60 to 80% carbon efficiency? Yeah, that's exactly right. So whereas if you're doing high temperature, fast pyrolysis, you're gonna crack a lot of those carbon atoms as Paul showed, and you're gonna lose that carbon yield in vapors and oils and things like that. We, so those people are typically getting 30 to 50% carbon yield, best case. With our process, we're able to get 60 to 80% carbon yield. So it's a much better utilization of biomass um, and it requires less input uh, yeah. and sort of uh, more return on that. And it, it also helps with the economics since the biomass is the single greatest cost driver yeah. at gigaton scales. And just to be clear, so the, the, the carbon that's lost is emitted as CO2 because you're burning the syngas? Yes. And is there any other emission? Are there any like box or NOx or any other uh, emissions that are a potential concern from the thermal conversion? Yeah, so we have catalytic emission control systems that were also built in house to, uh, you know, that's my background is building catalytic reactors. And so we, we destroy all of those VCs, have low NOx. There's no SOx because biomass doesn't have a lot of sulfur. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're mostly emitting just CO2 and water from this system. And that's, it's, uh, you know, those would already be emitted if the biomass was degrading. So it's completely additional. Got it. And and there's no ash. It's all just the the char. Uh, the ash is integrated with the char, so it stays with it. So the silica, calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, these kinds of components, they're going to be uh, they're non-volatile, and so they'll stay with mm -hmm. the, just like any torrified carbon. They're going to stay within that structure. Got it. Yeah. I just yeah. this sort of highlights the point that you made that there's no such thing as well. There is a such thing, but the biochar varies widely in terms of what the actual outcome is, depending on how you do it. And I think that this is a really good illustration of that. Um, Andrew, were you going to say something? or well, I was just going to say that I, I think the really exciting thing about this approach and, and kind of difference is that today it's actually quite a bit cheaper and the, the technology exists. So we're ready to go with this. Um, right now, biomass, we can get paid to take biomass in many locations because it's a nuisance waste. Uh, and so you can get paid up to $50 a ton to take biomass as a tipping fee. So the economics are actually quite low. In the next couple of years, we can get this below $150 per ton cost and really disrupt sort of the permanent removal uh, industry. And this is great for everyone, right? It, it helps us scale uh, this, this climate change fight much faster um, and get it uh, to as, more as many people as we can. And, and the reactors, so you said two numbers. You said 45 tons a day. And then I think Paul's last slide said 60 tons a day. Is 60 tons a day kind of the where we're aiming for and 45 is where we are today? Or, and this is a feedstock process. Yeah, that, that was the basis we used for the Monte Carlo okay. approach with 60 tons a day. Uh, it was somewhat arbitrary, but uh, yeah, the 45 tons a day is a single reactor uh, that we're going to be looking at. And multiple reactors can go on site. So our reactors sit on trailers. They, you can add them, remove them. 
uh, as needed, depending on the biomass supply. And so each reactor, depending on its performance, might do, I'm just, my math here was, you know, so 80%, so it's at least 36. So it's going to be, you know, in the order of 12 to 15,000 tons per year, depending on their efficiency. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, got it. Cool. Um, we didn't, I didn't send you this one, but manufacturing, I mean, I just, you know, manufacturing is hard. Um, how, how, how are you going to make a million of these things? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and that's part of why one of our uh, founding team members uh, owns and operates one of the largest bulk material handling equipment facilities uh, in the U.S. And it, it really is a bulk material handling problem when you get down to it. We need to move a trillion tons of something. Uh, we need enormous amounts of manufacturing and storage locations to do that. And so we've, the way we've tackled this is no one on the earth is, is capable of reaching that scale of production. So if you go try to purchase a pyrolysis reactor, you, you know, you can't, it's going to take you many years to get a single one. Uh, and so we've insourced a lot of that, built it vertically inside so that we can build these things incredibly rapidly. And, and the truth is today we can build about 50 of these a year and we can rapidly scale that as needed. Uh, so that you're right, the manufacturing is a, is a bit of a, you know, secret sauce and a bit of a, a challenge, uh, but it's definitely a surmountable challenge when you look at all the challenges that are uh, out here for climate change. Yep. Um, there are a lot of great, great questions in the chat, so I'm going to try to like leave a couple topics for, for Tank to, um, in the Q&A. Um, one quick question on, um, there are a lot of questions about burial site and all that. One quick question specifically on the understood that you're taking the 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 aerobic the 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 carbohydrate out of the out of the feedstock and so that leads to a more recalcitrant char um so i think this you know the 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 fact that it decomposes more slowly is clear so your burial will create an ana an anaerobic or anoxic environment so there will be no aerobic decomposition or a very tiny bit as the oxygen gets consumed by anything can you talk a little bit about anaerobic decomposition and methanogenesis? Is there science that indicates that char cannot be consumed by methanogens? Yeah, we, we actually address this, and I'll, I'll kind of summarize it in our paper. So if you if you look at it, the last section addresses this exact uh, question. So there's a lot of research on decomposition of, of biomass, but uh, less research on biochar decomposition. Uh, there's at least seven major mechanisms by which it, it can decompose. Now, if you bury it underground, the, the best research on this that wasn't done by us, and I cite this in the manuscript, if you or the paper, if you go find it, is that once you bury it underground, the decomposition will, the methanogenesis will stop. Now, you can, if you bury with that biocarbon additional carbohydrates, so you mix together torrefied carbon plus carbohydrates like, like trees, it'll generate uh, microbes and fungi that will then have the ability to decompose the char. So the idea of bearing, bearing uh, torrefied carbon by itself underground uh, is what makes it so stable. And you have to keep away other food sources that are much easier to process. Uh, the, but torrefied carbon by itself will be stable, but not if there's other food sources around. Got it. That's a very big summary, simple summary of a no, lot of very high quality research done by others. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very uh, under understood. It's a complicated question. I mean, we've had biomass, terrestrial biomass burial who bury the whole wood biomass on the show. And I guess their assertion is that lignin is resistant to methanogenesis. Um, but obviously, other forms of biomass are much less resistant. And it makes sense that char would be more resistant. Um, one, let's see, one last question. Uh, can you talk about, um, because there are a bunch of questions about the siting and definitely want to get into like what kinds of sites work for this from a burial perspective. But on the MRV, it seems very clear that you can figure out what the carbon content is of the char that you're burying. That seems no problem. Great. How, if you're burying this deep underground in a mine, for example, how are you going to monitor the project? But can you talk a little bit about anything you can share about the instrumentation of the monitoring? Like how, you know, the key thing will be to make sure that these things aren't creating you know, we don't think they should, but methane bombs underground. And so like, how are you monitoring for CO2 emission, methane emission, any, and any other important factors that you're monitoring from an instrumentation perspective? Like, how do you power these things? How do they, how do you read them without having to dig up each site and like check it manually, which obviously we don't want to do. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'll touch on this and then if Paul wants to add anything. Uh, so it depends a bit on the burial scenario. And you had you said there's some questions around that. So I can kind of jump into that and then touch on each different scenario. So we're, we're trying not to dig a hole if we don't have to. Um, and there's the truth is there's a lot of existing holes that need remediation uh, today. And so we have really a three-pronged burial strategy. One is burial in landfill, and I'll get to that. One is burial in abandoned mines. And the, the third is burial in abandoned quarries or pits, which are really dotted all around the United States. And each of those have sort of different requirements on how we're gonna be monitoring them. Uh, in the landfill scenario, there's actually a lot of co-benefits of bury burying the, the solid carbon or char. Um, essentially, it acts like a Brita filter through that landfill. Uh, and will filter out, you know, forever chemicals like PFAS, toxins like mercury and lead, and prevent those from getting into wastewater streams. Uh, it also decreases odor, which has community benefits uh, around those landfill uh, locations. Um, and it's used as an alternative daily cover, which is already required in many, many states. Uh, so that's one of the approaches we're looking at. It's also a very interesting scientific approach, since there is fresh organic material in a landfill. And there's a lot of data on uh, you know, degradation of lignin and, and cellulose in landfills and methanogenesis. They're also very anoxic uh, zones. And they're also the ones that we're, we're dealing with are capped and the methane is, is captured uh, either for use or for flaring. And so there's already monitoring in place uh, for that uh, species. And part of what we're doing in the next year is studying, you know, what's going to happen in a landfill environment since it is a bit more active than, for example, a mine. Um, and then when we look at the mine and aggregate pit scenario, there's not as much activity. We can cover it, make it pretty anoxic very quickly. Uh, and there you're just monitoring for methane production um, because it is anoxic, you know, monitoring for oxygen in those systems. And that's, that's all really easy to do with, you know, off the shelf measurement equipment. But Paul, is there anything else you wanted to add? To yeah, I was just gonna say our last company uh, a decade ago, specializes in methane detection and methane quantification. So uh, the, these technologies exist out there, not just from our company, uh, but it's it's very trackable. Uh, it's very easy to quantify methane emissions, and that's something that can be done continuously. Got it. Okay. And, and would the would the instrumentation live in the chamber or above ground or somewhere in between? So you you can monitor above ground um, to look at what's percolating up. Uh, it really depends on how you're burying it and at what time scales you're trying to look at. Got it. Cool. Um, all right. Um, Tank, you want to come on and start asking some of these audience questions? Thank you guys so much for for bearing with me on those and, and giving such great answer. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, yes, we do have tons of questions. Um, we're going to try and get through it. But I want to start with, um, I guess, the beginning of the process. So um, someone asked, like, what is the best feedstocks um, that you, you know, in, in, in your um trials that what are the, some of the best feedstocks um so I was wondering also like um is it are you looking at moisture level or are you looking at what kind of uh characteristics that or factors go into this to determine the uh, good feedstocks yeah yeah the, the best feedstock for us is cheap and dry because uh, you get the highest carbon yield from that um beyond that you know we really can take anything we've looked at agricultural waste we've looked at uh woody waste there's a surplus of wood waste in this country and specifically in our geographical area. And so that's what we're starting with. Uh, the Emerald ash borer has decimated uh, an enormous number of trees and it's actually created sort of a biohazardous waste that is quarantined and, and there's a nuisance waste issue. Uh, so that's what we're focusing on today. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so this, uh, another question to get, um, well, let's go into the site selection question. So. Um, someone asked that not every city has an abandoned mines or abandoned quarry. So um, how are new burial sites uh, selected or um, what kind of new burial sites would be needed uh, for, for this process? Yeah, so anywhere there's building activity, there's going to be an aggregate pit nearby because people learned moving sand long distances and, and rock uh, doesn't pay. Uh, so there's typically usually an aggregate pit nearby uh, or a landfill. Uh, in addition, we can dig or mound our own, uh, and we're looking into kind of the economics behind that. We've modeled some of it in that paper uh, yeah. as kind of a worst case scenario. Yeah, if I just add on to what Andrew said, if you look in the, the publication that we put out, we included burial 
as one of the factors affecting both the, the, the economics and the, the processing. And if you look, it doesn't show up as anywhere near the top for the most sensitive factor in the cost of processing this. So we're interested, of course, in, in existing holes uh, or opportunities, but adding our, our, our own burial, uh, generating our own holes is not a significant cost contributor to the overall economics. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, someone also uh, asked about feedstock. So other than plant-based feedstocks, uh, is it possible to use um, other feedstocks such as like manure? Um, and instead of burying it, um, is there any application to the charge itself for, for other purposes? Yeah, Paul, do you want to, I could take the, the second, the latter question, then we could kick it over to you for the first question. So in terms of other uses of the, the charcoal, so we actually started this company as, as a sort of soil amendment biochar company. And then we became a little scared as we started to learn some of the newer science that shows that, you know, that the biochar isn't really permanent. Once you put it into a soil, it starts degrading immediately. It starts to break down into smaller and smaller uh, particles. The HC ratio changes. And this is newer science that's coming online here. Um, so I think, you know, what you're looking at in that scenario is just not a permanent removal, uh, but it could be part of a, a portfolio of, of removal strategies for companies. And so we really wanted to focus on burying deep, which we think is the best uh, utilization of this char from a climate perspective to store the most carbon and really mitigate climate change. Uh, there are other use cases of the charcoal, you know, for example, as an aggregate in concrete, um, and many other uh, potential use cases. Some of them uh, will remove the carbon. Uh, some of them are being burned as a, as a coal replacement and, and don't have the same you know, environmental positive impacts uh, or not quite as much. So Paul, is there anything you can add to that? And then the, the first question. I think I go to the first question. You know, you were asking about other feedstocks, and I think Andrew hit on this earlier. The if you looked at the sensitivity analysis, the moisture content is is really important, uh, and that's because it affects the energy balance of what we're doing. So, as as we've talked about, our goal was to build a reactor that was robust, portable, low cost, but also amenable to all sorts of different feeds, and that has to do with both the the processing, so we can put in, uh, it's designed so we can move around and put in and get out all sorts of different types of biomass, depending on how they pack or move. Um, and that that robustness comes from the fact that we are working with a manufacturer that 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 is used to using moving all sorts of different types of biomass around. If I think about moisture content, you specifically asked about manure. And uh, I'm in Minnesota, and Andrew and I are both in Minnesota, where manure is a really big issue uh, of all different types. Now, not, not to get too far into it, but the, the differences in manure between different animals is, is uh, quite different. Uh, there's a high uh, fiber content, which is a, a carbohydrate material, which is good for what we want to do. But the, the uh, some types of manure have a higher moisture content than others, and so re reducing the moisture content of any type of manure enables it to get below that that percentage that Andrew was talking about earlier in that range of, you know, we'd like it to be as low as like 10%. So a drying process where it would sit on the field or in a in container is good. So, but some manures are are ready to go before that drying process. So it, it it's on a case by case basis, depending primarily on the moisture content. Got it. So moisture content is key uh, here. Okay. Um, a lot of the audience also asked, like, it, throughout your process, do you create syngas? And if so, uh, what do you do with it? Um, so I'll, I'll start, maybe Andrew can add, is, you know, in any uh, torrefaction or pyrolysis or fast pyrolysis process, you're going to have a distribution of products. Uh, fast pyrolysis is designed to maximize vapors. Gasification, the high end is designed to make uh, permanent gases like CO or H2, and our process is designed to maximize solids. So we're going to maximize the solid carbon, but we are going to make a small amount of vapors and permanent gases, like you say. That's going to go through the uh, uh, the conversion process to make the process autothermal, and it's going to come out in the end, as Andrew said, as water and CO2. Yeah, Paul and, I, Paul and I actually met in 2005 trying to make hydrogen from biomass. <laughs> And it's a difficult proposition because it's only 6%, you know, by weight, uh, but also it, it is very difficult to clean up. So one more question about burial. So someone also asked, um, how deep do you need to bury it? Um, is it, you know, the deeper, the better? Is that sort of thinking? 
Yeah, it, the main requirement requirement for us, and I saw another question about water and burial as well. We we don't care that the benefit of this approach versus just burying biomass directly is we don't care about water. We don't need to encapsulate this in plastic and prevent water intrusion um, because of course biomass itself, lignin, cellulose are food sources for microbes. But when we when we torrify it and convert it to uh, essentially a charcoal, um, it's it's no longer that food source. So our our main requirement is to be underground and anoxic regions and to get anoxic depending on the soil type it's about 30 centimeters deep or so um so that's you know a couple feet deep um and then of course we can go deeper with the with the charcoal as well okay so uh, a couple feet deep or you know 30 centimeters or lower um how much you know carbon um are you expected to store um you know um on, on a ton basis a billion tons <laughs> a year. No, I, so our, our plans are to get to billions of tons per year. Uh, the biomass waste, it's, it's not a question of, is there enough biomass waste? It's a question of getting to that biomass waste, processing in it, and then in a similarly decentralized way, uh, taking the product and, and storing it. And so that's the, the thesis behind what we're doing is that biomass is an inherently decentralized uh, source. And so we need to be decentralized in our thinking of how we're capturing it, processing it, and then eventually burying it. All right, great, thank you. And then I think the last um, question here, um, a lot of the audience also asked, like, what is that, uh, what is your business model? So what is your thinking of um, scaling, right? Are you a um, machine, are you a, sorry, uh, equipment manufacturer, or are you gonna be developing product uh, projects on your, on your own? Yeah, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I can touch on that. So, you know, initially it, it's important that we sort of vertically integrate and do a lot of these things ourselves, built to build credibility with the buyers and have oversight on everything that's going on. So we do, uh, you know, build these these reactors with our with our co-founder at his site. We design them ourselves. We operate these sites uh, with partners. So we partnered with Waste Management down in Burnsville, Minnesota, to launch our first site, which goes live in a couple of months in Burnsville, Minnesota. Um, and they will be doing the burial portion for us in the landfill. Uh, but essentially, as we grow, you know, there are a couple of models that we've tossed around, potentially licensing and franchising these things. Uh, but that that's a ways away before any of that would make sense. Thank you. So th thank you all for joining us today. Um, I will hand it back to Toby. Thank you, Tank. Great job. And uh, thank you to the audience for um, so many great questions. I'm sorry we were not able to get to them all, but we need to wrap up now. Um, and uh, Paul and Andrew, that was really fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us and for sharing uh, all of that great um, information about what CARBA is up to. Um, wishing you great success with your next steps and look forward to talking more in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Um, all right, so we're gonna just do a quick, quick few quick programming notes and then we're gonna sign off. Um, as always, we have two pieces of active legislation in Massachusetts and California. If you are in either of those states and you haven't done so already, please reach out to us. We have call tools to call your local legislators on these, um, on these bills and it's really kind of crunch time now. We could really use the help. Uh, German language, this is CDR. Uh, next Tuesday, we have our friend Martin from Octavia Carbon to talk about DAC in Kenya. Um, very exciting, and please tune into that. Um, Chris will put a link in the chat. It is in German, so you can either tune in and learn German or you can tune in and listen in German. Um, this is CDR. We've got a bunch of great episodes coming up in August. Um, next week, uh, Equatic, um, which has been on the show previously a year or year and a half ago under its previous name, Sea Change. Um, they've had a lot of great uh, progress since then, made some changes. Um, their new principal advisor, um, he technically cannot be the, called the CEO, um, but Dr. Lorenzo Corsini will be here to present what Equatic is up to and what's going on with them. And we look forward to that. And uh, see you next week. Scott, we will. We should learn some German. You're absolutely correct. Um, all right. Thanks so much. See you next week. And thank you again to Andrew and Paul for being with us. Thank you.